Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and spending part of your evening learning about Canberra and how it can help your patients in your own practice. We're really excited to share the risk assessment practice data we've compiled over the last two years. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First, you are all muted, so we cannot hear any comments or questions verbally. But please make sure to type questions into the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes to answer questions. Um, and we will do our best to get through as many of those as possible. Any questions we don't have time for will be addressed by email. And we also offer one-on-one -on -one webinars for practices interested in learning more. We are pleased to have Dr. Michael McClure with us today to share some of his own experiences incorporating Canberra into his practice. Um, Dr. McClure attended dental school at the University of Florida, graduating in 2000. Following graduation, Dr. McClure served five years as a Navy dental officer. Since then, he has been practicing dentistry in Orange Park, Florida. In 2012, he was awarded a mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry, which is recognized as one of the highest levels of achievement in all of dentistry. We are really happy to have him here to share his experience. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Kim Cooch, CEO and founder of Oral Biotech and the Curry Free System. Dr. Cooch has been successfully practicing dentistry for 30 years still practicing three days a week here in Albany, Oregon. He has a huge vision for curing dental caries, motivating him to start this company. And it continues to motivate him with the research he's leading to improve caries diagnosis and treatment. He has a lot of passion for what he does, and it's always great to hear him speak. So with that, Dr. Cooch, take it away. Hey, thank you so much. Um, welcome, everybody, tonight. We're, uh, we've got a really, a, I think, a, an interesting and fun program. This is, these are questions that I get asked all the time. And so I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Let's put it that way. So um, let's get started. Tonight's topic it actually is uh, the truth about return on investment. I mean, I, I hear practices all the time ask me, but, you know, how do you, how do you make money doing Canberra? Um, how do you incorporate that into your practice, and what's the return on investment in, in terms of doing that? Like, it's wonderful to do things, but if it costs us money and, and we are a business, uh, you know, we all understand the concept of overhead and the fact that we have to pay our staff and our labs and we have expenses, and so we need to have income to offset that. And certainly we deserve to be paid for our, um, our knowledge and our skills as well. So, you know, the return on investment in Canberra, it, it, it's an interesting question. And so I thought, well, I sat down when we really conceived the idea for this webinar and thought, you know, well, let's just, let's pencil it out. I mean, when I look at return on investment in, in, in any business, I always like to sit down with a pencil and a paper and try and sort through that. So I think you'll find it kind of interesting here tonight. Um, the first place I start with uh, the return on investment is, and actually, I'm going to kind of break this down into three areas tonight, and then we're going to hear from Mike, which I'm really excited to hear. Um, but I want to start with the actual money. You know, as we do procedures related to Canberra, how do we get paid? You know, what do we get paid, and what kind of expected return do we have just on performing those, you know, individual procedures? And then I want to talk kind of about the social capital, like practicing this way. What does that do to, you know, what kind of impact does that have on your practice? And then last, I'm going to add just a, a couple of comments on, you know, the, the spiritual capital. I mean, what does it do to you as a person to be able to provide this kind of care for your patients uh, in terms of how do you feel better about yourself and, you know, your self-esteem and, and actually being excited to get up and go to work no more, just to help, to reach out and help people that are in need. So um, that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to start here with uh, the hand, you know, the you know, where the rubber hits the pavement, and we start with the risk assessment. And there's a number of decisions that you need to make in terms of using a risk assessment form. You know, who's going to fill it out? You're going to have the patient fill it out. Of course, you know, the form that we use, we have, uh, you know, the motivational interview, uh, coaching questions, behavioral questions at the start. The patient fills out the top half of the form. They self-identify their risk factors. And we have, you know, reasons and experience as to why we, we have it, you know, set up that way. But, you know, basically, you know, you're 
your options are your patient could fill out the risk assessment form. Ahead of time, they could fill it out in your reception area. The, the hygienist or the assistant or dentist could interview the patient and fill it out with them, kind of interview style. That takes, that takes quite a bit of time. Um, but then you have to decide, you know, and who am I going to do this on? Am I going to do this just on new patients? Am I going to use a risk assessment form on all patients one time a year? Am I going to use it on just the patients that I, I believe are high risk that I'm targeting to identify and treat those people? And I, I, this is interesting because our landscape is changing. Uh, and it, I mean, some exciting developments. I think I mentioned in the last two, two webinars that we're going to have CDT codes for risk assessment. Uh, three new codes, and we'll talk about those here in a second. But interestingly enough, that doesn't mean that you and I are automatically going to get payment for doing a filling out a risk assessment form. The next step in this process is for the insurance companies to actually create insurance plans that provide a benefit um, for that for those procedures, and that then that plan has to be presented to employers and, more importantly, employees who then want to invest their insurance dollars in, in buying a plan like that. Now, I was at the Canberra meeting, um, the Western Canberra Coalition meeting in August, uh, middle of August, in, uh, at actually it was the University of Pacific Dental School, and I think there were either five or six major dental insurance companies were represented at that meeting. And they're rapidly trying to figure out how to respond to these new codes and to create plans uh, that will enable um, us to be able to provide this kind of care and be reimbursed for it and plans that, you know, obviously that they see value in and that we can provide to employers and employees. And I would tell you, I would share with you that the very first insurance program that's already ready to roll out um, January 1 with this are planning on reimbursing. Um, they've already got the plan written. It's already, uh, it's already been done. And they're going to reimburse at $50 per form. Uh, for a carries risk assessment form with a filed under one of the new diagnostic, well, they're not diagnostic codes, filed under one of the new CDT codes for risk assessment, um, they're going to reimburse that at $50 per form per year. Now, if you have an average size practice and you have 1,200 patients and you had everybody on an insurance plan like that, which I think that is coming. Uh, I mean, the good news is that's, that's just, just ahead on the road here for us. But 1,200 patients one time a year, $50 per patient, that's $60,000 a year in, in, in additional revenue in your practice uh, just for filling out the form and filing the correct CDT code on that. So that's a significant amount of, of revenue um, that adds to your hygiene appointment. It makes it very much worthwhile to, from a fine, just a straight financial um, standpoint, to fill that form out and review it and go through it with the patient. Of course, obviously, uh, we believe that the net result of going through that process is that you're going to identify risk factors for patients, help them modify or reduce those risk factors, and make them less susceptible to dental caries, and in the long run, be healthier for it. So I mentioned the new CDT codes, and here they are, a DO-601 for a caries risk assessment and documentation with a finding of low risk using recognized assessment tools. Uh, we believe that, um, that there's probably a half a dozen assessment tools out there, including the carry free form that would qualify, and the DO-602, DO-603. So you're going to see, you may not have them right now, but uh, or even early in 2014, but I, you are going to see uh, growth in terms of the number of plans of patients you know, bring into your dental practice that have coverage for this kind of care. Now the next place that um, we really have an opportunity for revenue uh, in or a return on investment is using a biometric. And there are a number of different biometrics on the market. I'm just going to go, I, I went to the Patterson catalog, I looked at the prices, I'm going to you know, just give you that data tonight, um, and then we'll kind of calculate if you did this a biometric once a year on a patient just to have a, a test or a kind of a baseline on the patient to give you additional data, um, you know, how much revenue would that add to your practice? Uh, one of these is the CRT uh, bacteria culture from Bevadent. Um, I used this for several years, probably 12, 13 years ago. Uh, currently, it costs $117.50 for six test kits. What? Okay, um, and the um, the culture kit is uh, $19.58 per test. Requires an oven. Takes about 48 hours to, to incubate that and then test it. 
Uh, you collect a, a saliva sample to do that with. Uh, and I had the challenge for me was a managerial one in my own practice, um, just trying to culture these, call the patient back in, try and get the results to them. Um, you know, that was a challenge. Another option is the monoclonal mutant streptococci test. This is from GC. Uh, $181.95 per 10 test. It works out to $18 per uh, 20 cents your cost per test. Uh, correlates, the study's been done, it correlates very well to the mutant streptococci. You have greater than 5 times 10 to the 5th colony forming uh, units per milliliter of saliva, which we know is high risk. Uh, it has 12 steps and it takes uh, I've performed this test a few times. It takes somewhere close to 15 minutes for me to do this test to just actually run through the steps. So that's an option for you. Um, and then we have the carry screen test. It's $147.50 for 25 swabs, which works out to $5.90 per test. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes to perform. You have kind of real-time results. Uh, and we know that that correlates to total bacterial load. And we know that it correlates to um, mutant streptococci and, and karyogenic bacterial load as well. So there's your options in terms of tests. One thing that I would tell you is uh, the hygienist or the assistant can perform these tests. If you tested each patient in your practice one time per year, your insurance coverage would be the CDT code D0425 carry susceptibility test. Um, the fee is, you know, could range anywhere in your practice from 10 to $25 to do that. Uh, some practices have been just included these into their pro fee, raised their pro fee five or ten dollars to cover the test, you know, one time per year. Um, I we do submit this fee in my own practice, and if you just charge five dollars more than um, whatever the cost of whichever test you're using is, uh, times twelve hundred, if you do that once a year, that would add about um, six thousand dollars a year in revenue to the practice. So you can see that's not really that substantial. In terms of therapeutic products, again, you have a lot of options on how you manage that. Uh, one way to manage that is to prescribe and let the patient, you know, buy direct. Uh, go to the pharmacy or, you know, call the companies direct and, and order product. Uh, you can dispense, you know, maintain a small inventory and dispense products directly to the patients. One of the, one of the things that I would share with you, and just in my own experience, um, as I started doing this 12 years ago. Writing a prescription, I think 51% uh, of prescriptions written in the United States uh, never get to the pharmacy. So, you know, there's a chance that probably half your patients that you prescribe some type of therapeutic product for probably won't even follow through and get it filled. So I found greater success in being able to put it in the patient's hands, instruct them on how to use it, you know, for a few minutes in the practice, um, and found much better results that way. I would also tell you that originally I started giving them just one month worth of materials to go use and found that you know I didn't see the patient for three months or four months or even six months and then we were back to square one and starting over. So I got to the point where I started putting three months worth of materials in their hands so they didn't have to come back in a month and continue to buy more product. It just made it more convenient for everybody. And then we had better follow through. So those were just issues that I worked through in my own practice. In terms of insurance coverage, certainly we have uh, if you're using fluoride varnish in your practice to treat uh, patients that have carry susceptibility, they're the moderate or high risk dental caries. That's the D1206 fluoride varnish code, um, and you know fees on that range somewhere in the you know 45 to 55 dollar range. Um, if you're using a home fluoride by report, some patients do have a coverage in their plan for home fluoride. Obviously, this would um, fit you know, any product that had for it and would have fit into that category. And um, based on our own internal experience, if we have a, a practice that's buying about $800 per month of materials, that's their cost. Uh, if they sold them to their patients at retail, um, they have a 40% margin. So they would gross about $1,333 per month, which gives a net to the practice of about $533 a month which works out to about $6,396 per year. So when we look at that, if we take the, obviously we look at the tangible uh, revenue here, uh, the real revenue from actually doing these procedures, and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of as, as we get reimbursed to fill out CARES risk assessment forms, uh, that's actually probably the lion's share of the materials that you're going to see uh, going, you know, or income that you're going to see, uh, that's the biggest category. And it's, it's huge by comparison to using a biometric or 
even to you know doing some uh, product or therapeutic sales of products to your to your patients. Now, not that um, biometrics and patient uh, handing product to the patient is not value. I, I absolutely believe in that. But when we look at where the real potential revenue here, uh, certainly the, the carriage risk assessment form stands out. But you know, could bring a net income of an additional $72,000 per year uh, into your practice for just doing these simple procedures, incorporating, incorporating this um, philosophy of care into your practice. You know, so that's really the tangible, um, you know, where the rubber hits the pavement. Let's talk about what about if the, in, the intangible return on investment, and this is really um, more social capital. What kind of reputation, what does this do to um, to the referrals of patients that you get from your own patients into your practice. You know, so the questions I think about, like, you know, what's the return on investment for helping patients become decay-free? And I have to tell you that, you know, that's a life-changing experience. And I, and I get to hear these wonderful um, stories from hygienists and from dentists that are doing this, you know, every week that, that call or, or send me an email and share some experience that they had that just really changed their patient's life. And it was highly impactful for that person. And I have to tell you, when you do that for somebody, and I've been doing this for 12 years now, and they have a life-changing experience, they go out and talk to a lot of people. And they tell people, they, they become ambassadors for your practice. And more so than the patient that had the pretty veneers and liked the results or the, you know, the other things that we do for patients, you know, they, they like us, they enjoy what we do, they, they, they really care about us, they appreciate what we do. but this is like at a gut level life-changing experience for somebody that's been plagued by this disease, maybe it has a tremendous amount of emotional baggage that goes along with, with you know, dental caries and, you know, really bad looking teeth. And I have to tell you that the impact this has on patients is like nothing that I have ever seen in my practice. You know, and, and, and I would tell you that when you take an approach with a patient that I, I'm really here, my goal for you is to help you, become, if this is your goal, is to become healthy and decay free. If you never had another cavity, that would nothing would make me happier than being able to help you accomplish that. And so, you know, patients, you know, they look at you kind of quizzically, like, you know, Doc, if, if this works, aren't you, know, aren't you putting yourself out of business? And, and uh, I think that's one of the unspoken fears that the professions had. Gee, if we really can help patients stop getting decay, uh, aren't we all going to be out of business, and I, I have to tell you that getting somebody decay-free is the first step in having the opportunity to do a lot of elective dentistry and major restorative cases for them. And, I, um, you know, Bob Barkley tried to teach us that in the 1970s. I didn't understand where he was coming from. I get it today because I've seen that happen in my own practice and happen a lot, and that kind of caught me off guard. But let's talk about the downside. So. We're helping patients reduce their decay. Um, you know, the downside is you may lose some revenue from certain procedures. I've got Stacy's experience. I had a hygienist that contacted us uh, a couple of weeks ago. She had this patient who's been plagued with calculus um, like all his life, and the guy's you know middle aged, and he would come in every three months for periotherapy, and he would always have tons of calculus on his teeth, and it was a uh, you know uh, not the you know, it's not a pleasant experience to have to do that every three months, and it's not something that, you know, anybody looks forward to. And so she put him on the carry free uh, some products, um, primarily because he was high risk for dental caries as well, and he comes back in three months and he has, like, literally no calculus. And she ended up canceling his perinatal therapy appointment because he didn't need anything. And, you know, so you, you look at, well, what did that cost the practice in that hour, but this what happened for that patient and how it changed his life, you can't buy that kind of advertisement. That kind of testimonial from a patient will go out and tell 14 or 15 people immediately until any time somebody has a question about dentistry will become one of your advocates out there. I have to tell you, money doesn't buy that kind of advertising and that kind of marketing. So you know, while it costs some money in the short term, and that's a downside, we have to look at the big picture in the long term. You know, one other thing that I, I want to bring up too, and this is a this is a hot topic right now in dentistry, and I, and I think this is our again our playing field is kind of changing, the landscape's changing a little bit as we learn more about you know class two 
lesions that are found, you know, interproximally, and, and at what point in time we make a decision to restore them. But I now take it upon myself and have for a number of years to try and remineralize them first. Work with the patient, teach them how to floss properly, you know, tell them about remineralization and trying to repair this lesion and giving them the opportunity to repair it rather than immediately starting in with a, a needle and a drill. And so, and we know that's appropriate. I mean, the science is, is uh, abundant and it's clear that we should be doing more and more of that. Now, obviously, it takes patient participation. Um, you know, they do need to floss every day and they do need to use products that are going to help them remineralize and repair that area, but it can be done and I see it done all the time in my practice. And so I give up a class two restoration and the revenue I would have made for that um, in the process of remineralizing the tooth, but I have to tell you what you buy in terms of the relationship with the patient in doing that. It's better care. It's better for the patient. That's how I want, I want my children treated. It's how I would want my, you know, my parents treated. It's, how, it's what I want for myself. And so that's a level of care that I think people really appreciate and respect. And I, I just saw this patient last week. You know, here's the dates. If you look at the, uh, the interproximal lesion there on the distal of number four, now I, I think if I took a show of hands, how many people would restore this, how many people would try and remineralize it, and how many people would watch it, we would get a mixture of hands that go up in the room. It's like, you know, do I make a decision to, do I, do I restore that? Does, uh, do I try and remineralize it? Um, if I don't restore it, am I uh, at, at risk for negligence, for failure to diagnose dental caries. Uh, if I restore it, have I over-diagnosed and over-treated the patient? I mean, these are the real issues that, that we as practitioners have to make that decision like 20, 30, 40 times a day. What do we do with this, right? Well, I gave this patient a year ago the opportunity to floss and try and, and I gave her their carry-free gel and try and remineralize this. And this is what it looked like when she came in uh, last week. And you know what? I'm excited about that. I can't begin to tell you how excited she was because she could see the difference on the radiograph as well. So it's like it works. If you get somebody that participates, they're excited. Yep, I gave up uh, a few hundred dollars for that, but I have a patient that I have a, an incredible relationship with uh, that's going to be a great ambassador for my practice as well. So, you know, when we look at, we go back to the ICDOS, and this is where the challenges are for us particularly on a, a, occlusal fissures, and this is, if you haven't seen the International Caries uh, Diagnosis and Assessment uh, System, this is uh, site-specific for occlusal, you know, fissures. And, of course, we have an ICDOS code 0, which is perfectly intact and healthy, the code 1 that has a little bit of stain, and we go all the way out to an ICDOS code 6, which is, you know, grossly cavitated. And, you know, we need to make the decision. I mean, I look at this and I think, well, this is ridiculous. I don't need like seven stages here to identify when I'm doing a diagnosis and tooth number two has a code three and tooth number four has a code four, or maybe it's halfway between a code four and a code five. I mean, th this is cumbersome and ridiculous. But here's the point. Everything to the left, we know we can seal, right? And everything to the right of, of a code four, we know that we need to restore. The question becomes, what, are you, what do we do with those code threes? I mean, I really need a, a three teeth on the picture here, or maybe even one tooth. And it really comes down to, you know, this code three, when do you make a decision to restore that, and when do you make a decision to put a sealant in it? And, you know, that's the big question, and I would tell you that we need to make that answer based on risk. You know, the high-risk patients, I'm going to be more inclined to do what Doug Young calls a, a, a dental caries biopsy. I'm going to, you know, take a diamond burr or air abrasion or laser, and I'm going to start to to look into that fissure, open it up, and see what I've got. On a patient that's low risk, you know, somebody that's, uh, you know, an older patient and it hasn't cavitated in 30 or 40 or 60 years, you know, I get less excited about having to worry about that. And I know that you all make those same decisions. Well, I got this from Doug while I was at, at UOP at the camera meeting, <clears throat> and one of the topics that's coming up is well, when do we restore interproximal lesions? Because the lesions that I restored for my board exam 35 years ago, uh, today we should be remineralizing. And I mean, the science is clear on that. And so the question becomes, at what point in time can we remineralize and at what point in time do we have to restore? 
And so if you really go back and think about the IC DOS, it really comes down to the same issue. Now, if I, again I took a, a show of hands, who would restore and who would, who would uh, try and attempt to remineralize this or who would watch it and do nothing, uh, I, I would get a mixture of different responses here. But the evidence is, is clear that when you've got a D1, uh, actually an E2 lesion just penetrating the DEJ, that that can be remineralized. Uh, and anything to the right of, uh, obviously, that's penetrated into the D2, the middle third of the dentin, and, and deeper, we have to restore. That we know. The question becomes, you know, when you just have an E2 lesion like we see here, um, anything to the left of that, anything smaller than an E2 at the DEJ, we know that we should be attempting to remineralize that because it's not cavitated on the surface. Now the problem becomes, again, instead of looking at six or seven different gradations of this, um, you know, the question becomes, what do you do with this D2 or this uh, E2 D1 lesion? Some of them are cavitated, some of them aren't. Do you try to remineralize that? Should we restore it? Should we watch it? Um, and again, it's just like that, you know, IC DOS class three occlusal fissure. Uh, I would propose to you, there's a big question, you know, in my mind, and yet you and I have to make that decision. And I would tell you, we're going to make that decision based on risk. If that's a high-risk patient and I see that um, into the penetrating through the DEJ, I'm going to try and re probably be more inclined to restore that. And on somebody that's moderate or low risk, I'm going to point it out to them, and we're going to try and remineralize that. And so one of the things I want you to think about, we in the profession say watch. At least, and I'm guilty of this as well as everybody else, but it's just part of our, our, our language. But it's like we watch everything. And you know, all day long, I'm telling my hygienist, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to put a watch on that. And the next time that you say watch, I want you to think we should remineralize that. And maybe we should you know, use carry-free gel, you know, the CTX4 gel. The next time you say watch, I want you to think CTX4 gel. If the person is not high risk and they don't have numerous lesions in their mouth they're concerned about, Let's talk about trying to remineralize it. And if you have a motivated patient, as you talk to them, you may even want to try and remineralize those lesions in a high-risk patient for six months or a year to see if you can get some improvement out of them. So I just wanted to kind of throw this out. This is a topic that you're going to see probably addressed by the ADA down the road. It's, it's something that certainly we're all talking about at what point in time. How do we make this decision, and how do we as a profession deal with that? <clears throat> now, on the, so those are the downsides. You may lose a few pr procedures um, if you can remineralize them. And at some point in time, I would hope that we're going to see insurance codes, CDT codes, uh, for remineralization procedures. Um, I think that's reasonable. I think that's probably the next step in the process here for us. Because again, if we're going to diagnose, treat, apply re remineralization, and follow and, and monitor and help that patient, um, you know, we obviously should be re it's fair for us to be reimbursed for that service. <clears throat> now, the upside here. Uh, for, by doing all of this is the increased word of mouth referrals. I have to tell you that uh, you know my my practice generates a lot of new patients every month, and by far the majority of those patients are direct referrals from our own existing patients, and those are the best referrals. Those are the best new patients that I get. Um, it's going to increase your major restorative dentistry. The more people that you get healthy in your practice, and I think this is this is what Bob Barkley knew. The more people that you get healthy. Um, and get them decay free, and they have confidence in their own health, uh, the more large restorative cases that you're going to do. So while this is a minimally invasive procedure, um, and it's really a wellness concept, it really leads to somebody having greater confidence to take the step and, and do more elective restorative procedures in, you know, in their own mouth. And I've seen that the number of large restorative cases that I do now uh, is dramatically uh, there are dramatically more cases that I treat this way now than I did, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I talked earlier kind of about your spiritual capital. You know, what is this? How does this help you as a person, spiritually or emotionally? And I have to tell you that I, there isn't anything that's given me more satisfaction um, doing this in my in my practice with my patients and feeling better about who I am. Excited to get up in the morning, go to the office. You know, kind of being surrounded by the love. I mean, you know, I saw a little three-year-old patient this morning that we helped the mother um, keep him out of the operating room and had a general anesthesia procedure. 
and this little kid is doing great, and we're working on remineralizing um, lesions with him. And I, I look at that, and I think, you know, the happiness and satisfaction on, on, on the kid's face and, and the mother, or whether it was the, um, the senior citizen patient that I saw yesterday in a wheelchair with her daughter that brought her in, and you know, talking about how I would want my mother treated. Or the patient that I finished up with at 5 o'clock tonight, we're going through and, um, you know, putting intermediate restorations to get all the lesions out of her mouth because she wants to save her teeth. And this, you know, young woman is in her early 30s. And we're taking the time to go through and do this and help her uh, get healthy and get well. The satisfaction of doing that is greater than anything else that I have done in my career. So, you know, that's, there's tremendous emotional capital that comes from doing that. The bottom line of, of, of having a practice like that is your income is going to increase. You know, whether it's tangible or intangible, you're going to see um, growth in your practice. And I can tell you through this entire recession, my practice, with the exception of one year, has continued to grow significantly. Uh, we were flat one year about three years ago, and, and I had unemployment rates in Lynn County here, uh, reported unemployment rates of 17%. Uh, that was the official rate. Now, the unofficial rate was probably, you know, 24 or 25 percent. It's still double digit here in Lynn County. So to have a practice growing uh, in that environment, I think it says a lot about this, what this kind of philosophy of care will do for your practice. You know, patients like this come in. You know, a young woman, um, you know, comes in like this, is 30 years old and about to lose her teeth, referred by another patient that I helped. Uh, in the same kind of situation, you know, people like this have given up hope on dentistry because she's had root canals and crowns, everything she's had has failed, and, you know, failed just literally because we didn't identify for her as a profession, we didn't help her identify what the risk, what was causing the disease. We were treating the signs and the symptoms of this disease, we weren't treating the cause of the disease. And so ultimately, things continue to fail, they go downhill, patients give up, and they let it go, and then they find out that there's hope. Um, I can actually be healthy. Somebody can help me figure out what's causing this disease and correct that, and I have an opportunity to have my teeth and be healthy. I can't, I can't begin to tell you um, the impact that has on a patient's life, and it will have on your practice. Um, and, you know, here's a woman that was in her 80s and came to me high risk, uh, had broken, you know, tooth number seven off, and, you know, got a lot of lesions, a lot of has dry mouth. If you look in her mouth, you can see that she's suffering from xerostomia but doesn't want to lose her teeth, right? Uh, I think a previous dentist had recommended that she have dentures and, and came. And here's somebody now that's planning on doing implants and doing a, a major restorative case um, as we can validate and document for her that we can keep her decay free. So, you know, the, to have the ability to help people like that, uh, it's a win, win, win. I mean, I, I can't find a downside for, for being able to do that for people. So, uh, you know, I would tell you that in my 34 years of practice, Canberra has been the most impactful thing that I have done in terms of what it's done for my practice, what it's done for my patients, and then what it's done for me personally, spiritually, emotionally, um, and financially. It, it's, it, it's changed my practice probably more than anything else that I've done. So um, in terms of return on investment, that's kind of uh, about the best way that I could cover that for you tonight. And right now, we've got Mike on the line. Mike, are you there? I am. Awesome. So, Mike, uh, just a, a little housekeeping here to let you know, I've got control of your slides. So as you need to have a slide advance, just tell me next or, you know, can give me the next slide. But I'm really looking forward to hearing about your experience and your thoughts on this topic. Uh, you're, you know, you're a young, successful practitioner, and I really just want to, I'm, I'm excited to hear from you. So, so fill us in, Mike. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, the uh, you can you can actually switch to the next slide. The um, <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about was uh, the first thing that brought me to Canberra. I started looking at Canberra initially back in the January timeframe. Um, I was studying for uh, board exams. Um, and I came across Canberra, but I didn't have a, a way to implement it very well in my office. So I was doing a lot of self-research online, trying to figure out ways that I could uh, come up with products to actually use with patients. I was, I was uh, uh, teaching patients how to mix uh, their own uh, sodium hypochlorite rinse at home 
and um, how to make a, a, a rinse to uh, increase the pH levels in their mouth and, and looking for xylitol and all the other products that Carry Free offers. And then uh, as I was continuing to look for things, I finally came across Carry Free, which I think was a, a, a thing that tremendously helped me um, a great deal because uh, everything was right there and very, very easy to implement. Um, so what I started doing was, uh, as far as implementation goes, if you, you can actually go to the, ne the next slide also. Okay. Um, the main thing for implementation uh, that you have to have on board is all your team members. You have to have your staff involved in, in doing this. And I think that's probably true for any type of technology that we bring into the office. Um, but they, they uh, are a tremendous help as far as implementing this in the practice. When I first purchased things, uh, products from Carry Free, um, and I got my Carry Screen bioluminescence tester in there, the first thing I did with that was we had a training day with the staff and everybody uh, got together. We tested everybody's, um, uh, tested everybody to see where everybody fell on it, and then we started doing training on why we were doing this and what we were doing this for. And, and uh, the excitement of the staff was, was tremendous. They bought into it immediately, and, and we found some, we had some surprising um, numbers, which I'm sure a lot of people out there have had also. Um, we have a couple uh, of young ladies in my office who have never had a cavity, never had a cavity when they were had their deciduous teeth, and, and as adults, they've never had a cavity, but they, two of them had the highest number that we tested. They were over 9,000 for both of them. Never had any caries, so obviously they had a lot of protective factors, um, but the, uh, uh, that really got them excited and, and involved in uh, implementing this into the office. Um, the way that we went about implementing it was we started out doing just our, our high caries risk patients initially, um, and we're, we're actually still doing that, and we're starting to change into incorporating it with everybody. But the reason that I chose high caries risk patients is we wanted to learn how to build a system and implement it in the office without becoming too burdensome um, for the staff and everybody involved. Because I think if, it, if we jumped in and, tr and tried to do it too heavily at first, then we were going to end up uh, basically turning, I think, turning against it and, and making it where it was harder and harder to, to work out. So the way that we've ended up doing it has worked out very, very well. We, we identified all new patients that came in um, as high risk if they you know, they ended up having uh, um, gross decay in their mouth or, or carious lesions on, on radiographs. Um, and, and the assistants, as they were taking x-rays, they would notice that and start immediately start talking to the patient about what we're trying to do um, with a, a program that we have in our office. As far as patients that were existing, um, for patients that were coming in, we'd identify patients in the morning huddle as high-risk patients, patients that still had outstanding dental treatment, and we would start talking to them about the process also. When we first implemented it, we um, implemented the program. We were doing it for the patients that were existing. They had an hour with the hygienist, and, and we found that um, sometimes it was burdensome as far as time goes with the hygienist who's taking all her radiographs and then uh, doing her you know, uh, probing periodontal screening and then me come in and going over treatment and, and whatnot. Um, and we did it that way for a while, and, and I found that the, the best way for my practice to actually operate and run is, is basically they tell me where I need to go. Um, the the uh, staff kind of directs me and, and moves me along through the schedule, and they were telling me that this was not working well because we were getting behind or, or sometimes we would end up falling behind. Um, so what we started to do was on those patients that are preexisting that we know are high risk, um, we would start introducing them to the program, but we would get them back either for if they needed uh, another appointment as far as hygiene goes or their first appointment as far as restorative goes. Um, we would actually go over the whole program at that point to, to uh, implement it with them at then. Um, as far as uh, how has Canberra impacted my practice, um, I, I would say, I mean, I, I, Everything that Dr. Cooch was talking about, I, I totally agree with. It, it not only has impacted me personally, and, and that's really the reason that I started doing it or started looking at doing uh, bringing Canberra into the office, um, but it also has uh, uh, professionally and, and financially, and I'll, I'll get into a couple examples of that um, towards the end. Uh, 
specifics about that that I'd like to talk about. As far as advice that I would give somebody um, thinking about Canberra or, or getting it started, I would I would say just you need you just need to do it. You need to start small if you need to start small, um, and just build yourself up to incorporating it with with all of your patients because it's it's not only personally I think it's the right thing to do and you feel good about doing it, um, but it, it's also something that's going to pay dividends as far as the return on investment and, and all the numbers that. Dr. Cooch was talking about as far as uh, the $50 for the carry screen test and, and all those things in the future. Um, those are all, all well and good, but I'm seeing a tremendous return on investment um, on the intangibles and then also the, the upsides, the increase uh, word of mouth referrals and, and restorative, major restorative work and, and things like that. And like I said, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, Dr. Cooch, could you switch to the next slide? Yeah, you know, Mike, one of the things that you just mentioned um, brought up a, a, a thought that I had. You know, the the capacity issue in the hygiene operatory is a real challenge for us always because whatever we do, um, you know, the hygienists are have so many procedures that they need to complete in a one-hour appointment that that one-hour appointment model ultimately needs to flex <laughs> somewhere down the road. I, I don't want to try and create a change of that right at the moment, but, but it really creates a challenge. And so the way that you solved it is kind of the way that I solved that as well. One other thing that I, one other thought I had about that is like my hygienists now handle a lot of the patient education. The, the minute they identify, you know, we, we do the forms once a year on every patient and, and all new patients, and they immediately identify that. And they've actually, you know, for years hygienists have seen themselves as periodontal therapists right? They really, their specialty was the gums and, you know, the roots of the teeth. And now I would tell you that my hygienists spend probably almost as much time as carry specialists or therapists. And I, to see the growth, that they have something new to learn and to participate with the patient on and the excitement that they have about this, it's really, I think, to watch them develop and grow uh, as professionals, I think it's really added a lot of personal satisfaction to my hygienist as well, um, instead of just being stuck as the gum therapist, uh, they get to participate in the patient's overall health and wellness. And so uh, I think that's a really, I don't know if, you, if, if, if your hygienist has started to, or if you've I noticed that, but that's something I, you just, as you were talking about, I'm thinking, you know, I've really watched my hygiene team really grow and develop as professionals, and that's really fun to, to watch as well. Anyway, didn't mean to interrupt you, Mike. Next. That's no, okay. I, I agree with you totally on that. Um, I, I have seen the same thing with my hygienists. They, uh, um, we do a lot of continuing education away from the office, and, and we went down to the uh, Florida National Dental Meeting um, back in June, and they went to a, a Canberra class, and they were they they were really excited to be there because all the girls that were there, they were the only ones that were actually doing it in their office. When they, the the lecturer asked who who was you know implementing or who has implemented Canberra in their practice. Both my hygienists were the only ones that had d done that, knew anything about it. And what they really liked was all of a sudden a lot of questions started coming their way. And they were teaching, you know, in, in the class, it was a discussion on camera protocol, but they were involved in teaching it. And it, it really gets them excited and, and you know, brings energy um, into the office and into their lives for what they're doing. Um, as far as uh, uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, I just want to give a couple of examples of some patients that we've seen that we've had some success with on, on different things, on different levels, not just with the patient but other things. Um, for instance, the first patient I wanted to talk about is Dennis. Um, Dennis came to me back in February time frame. Um, he, he came to me because he was frustrated with his, his other dental office. Um, he didn't feel like they were meeting his needs because over the last couple years, every six months when he was there, he ended up getting more restorative work done, and, and he didn't feel like he was getting an answer of why, because he was doing the best that he could. He was doing all the brushing and flossing like they were asking him to, and, and uh, he just didn't feel like something was working there. So he came to us, and he, he didn't know that we were doing Canberra or started Canberra in our office. Um, it just worked out perfectly that he came to us and had questions on, on things that we maybe had a little bit of insight that his other dentist wasn't talking to him about. Um, so we started him on the, the Canberra protocol back in, in March. Um, we used the carry screen uh, test. Uh, he tested um, in the plus 3,300 range for his uh, 
uh, bioluminescent uh, markers. Um, so he was high risk. Uh, he um, didn't have any restorative at that time. He had uh, or any any cavity active cavities at that time. But um, he came back in June, and uh, we retested him again. Um, he had scored about 3,100 again, which I told him initially when we first saw him that there's a good chance. You know, it takes a while for this type of dental infection to root itself into your into your oral environment and take over. It takes a while to get rid of it also. Um, so he wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised that his, his numbers weren't great um, at his three-month apartment. But he came back um, again in uh, September, and I saw him several a couple weeks ago. And uh, when he came in then, um, we tested him again. And this is the six months after, um, you know, his, his six-month mark, the part that he usually says he gets another cavity at. And uh, we, we tested him, um, looked at everything, and, and everything was cavity-free, was doing well. We did his uh, carry screen test, and he was actually down um, below 1,200 on his, his test. And you've never seen somebody so excited. He felt like he, he had a big success in his life, and, and uh, we felt good about it. And he ended up, you know, going on and, and doing it. And last week, um, on Monday, actually, we had two new patients come in, and they were referrals from Dennis. Um, it was his sister and his brother-in-law uh, came in to see, it, see us. Uh, his sister, she had, you know, unlike him, who had a, a lot of uh, restorative work and a history of cavities, surprisingly, she, she had great teeth, excellent uh, hygiene, no issues whatsoever. But her husband, um, Dennis's brother-in-law, wasn't so lucky. He, he has quite a, a bit of restorative work um, that needs to be done. He had extensive crown and bridge work done in the past, um, a lot of recurrent decay on those areas. Um, his test was over 9,000. It was very, very high. And uh, we started talking to him about what can be done and, and uh, actually had him back last Thursday. I saw him last, on Monday and then saw him again back last Thursday uh, to get, present a treatment plan. Now, we we're, we're presented a treatment plan that was extensive. It was a full arch on, of restorations um, to replace uh, carious uh, um, crown and bridge work that was done. Um, and, and some other teeth that didn't have any crown and bridge on them, and then a half arch on the other side uh, with implants on the lower also. A very, very extensive treatment plan, and, and the patient has accepted it. He has the means to do it. Now he feels like there's something that can be done as far as controlling um, possibly or, or increasing his risk of success for the long term because he wants to keep his teeth. He's very motivated to do so. Um, now his treatment plan... Uh, what is at least 10 times greater than my total investment on my initial carries free um, purchase when I bought the carry screen and, and all the uh, supplies and everything else with that. That's a tremendous return. I'm 10 times your, your money. And would I have gotten this patient if I hadn't been doing camber protocol? I don't think so. I, 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 don't, I don't know if Dennis, if we hadn't been doing it, um, if Dennis would have been as successful and felt great about us where he wanted to bring in family members. And I don't know if we would have been able to convince uh, his brother-in-law if, if, uh, if not for the Camber protocol. So I would say the upside on that one patient alone has paid for, um, you know, my carry free supplies for the, the next year or two or longer. I mean, it, it, it's going to work out tremendously for us and for the patient, which is really the main thing. Um, if you switch to the next slide... Dr. Cooch? Uh-oh. Hang on. Cuddy, what happened here? I lost... Lost control. What's that? Oh, no, but I lost the, uh, the slides. <laughs> oh, well, the next slide, I can just talk about it real quick. It's, it's easy. The next slide is actually from a young patient, a 10-year-old um, girl named... Oh, there she is. 10-year-old girl named Sydney. Um, she has, uh, we did or started early orthodontics on her um, to correct some issues that were going on. And uh, she had started getting some decalcifications around her brackets. Um, she was needed some help with her hygiene, which we did, but we, we started noticing decalcifications. So we tested her, and, and uh, sure enough, she came back with a, uh, uh, um, a uh, caries-free bioluminescent tester of, of about 2,300. It was over 1,500. She was high risk. Um, we saw, uh, like I said, we saw decalcification um, growing. So we put her on the rinse. I put her on the rinse, um, and she used it 
very diligently. I know this for a fact because it's actually my daughter. Um, and she used it uh, for the three months. I had her using it for three months period, and we retested her um, again. And she was one of the first patients that I actually put on this. Um, and her her test levels, uh, I mean, her bioluminescence uh, test score has dropped down below 1,500. Um, not only that, but her hygiene is much better because she was involved in, you know, doing this uh, kind of a little experiment with, with me and her. Um, and using the products, it, it actually got her to where her hygiene is much, much better now. She just got her, her brackets off, and her teeth look beautiful, no, no carious lesions, and, and so far no history of uh, active decay that needs restoration. So to me, that's, that's a bonus. It makes me feel good that, you know, she's starting off on the, ro on the right foot, um, and we're not having to put restorations in her teeth at an early age, and hopefully we never will as long as we continue down this road. Um, the, uh, the last thing I want to mention was uh, one other uh, personal patient success, su success story um, about, uh, again, about the intangibles or the, the uh, upside of using Canberra. We had a patient that I, I actually uh, wrote a, a little uh, blog about, a patient who is a, the wife of a doctor who came in, um, and she's on the program, and, and she's doing great with it also. Um, but she has been a tremendous source of new patient referrals. We track all our new patient referrals because I usually like to send a little thank you card with a, a little coffee mug with our logo on it and, and little flowers in it. We have a, a local florist put flowers in it for us and we'll send that to patients as a thank you for referring a patient in. Um, and over last month, not this month, but in the month of August, um, she had 11 patients come in that were referred from her, uh, which is Tremendous! It, it's driving, you know, driving new patients to us. All of our new patients basically are, are word of mouth, but now we're seeing a larger influx of these word of mouth patients um, from Canberra alone. Um, on the 11th, uh, little thank you card that I wrote out for with the little little mug and the, the flowers. I noted on the card that if she gets sent in one more patient, she's going to have a whole set. Um, of 12 mugs, which will be, be ready to go, and, and I think that's motivation to bring in new patients or to send in some more of her friends and family to uh, to us. So I can't stress enough how um, excited I am to be using this pro this protocol in my office, how um, successful it has been for us, um, like I said, personally and uh, professionally and financially, and I, I highly encourage you to get started in, in using this because I think it's going to pay off tremendous dividends for you also. And that, that's pretty much everything that I had to say, Dr. Fuchs, unless you have any questions or Boy, anything. no, I just really appreciate you, Mike, coming on tonight and sharing your experiences. I mean, <clears throat> those are the same kinds of experiences I see every day in my practice. And it's, uh, it's great to hear from me. It, it's even better when I hear from, from other practitioners like yourself, Mike. I, so I really appreciate I love hearing those stories. I mean, they just uh, it's one of the things I get out of bed in the morning for is you hear the success story, you help the patient, and, I, I, you know, having a patient send you 11 new patients in a month, I mean, I, I don't know what else you could have done in a practice for somebody that would motivate them to that kind of level. It, but, I mean, this is a, I mean, I think it's one of the things we've underestimated as a profession. When you get somebody who's suffered with, dental caries for a lifetime, you get them decay-free, it is a life-changing experience, and they go tell people about it. I mean, they become advocates for your practice, and so I've seen that happen, Mike. I, you know, God bless you. I can't wait to hear more about what, what happens in your practice down there. Um, I, I just, and I really appreciate you sharing that with us tonight. I, I think that, you know, obviously there are tangible returns on investment here, but the really big one is the intangible stuff, and, and it's really a win-win-win. A I mean, the patients get better care, they have greater predictability for long-term outcomes, and, you know, they have confidence in their health and their smile, they have confidence in you as their, as their dental home, their practitioner, and, you know, you just have so much, I, I think, greater satisfaction and personal satisfaction reward from, you know, going to practice and being able to help people like that. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us, Mike. We're going to have, uh, so Cody, we've got time for two or three questions here tonight. Uh, I know that we always have some great questions written in, so Mike, we'll even maybe get you to chime in on a couple of those as well. That'd be great. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kuchin, Dr. McClure. Um, and yes, we have some really great questions coming in. 
Um, so the first one is what increase in ROI do you see when we are just treating visibly high risk patients versus all patients? That's a great question. And I think, you know, Mike, I really loved how you introduced that topic tonight, how, you know, start small and grow. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially it's what I did in my own practice. I started treating the patients that were high risk because these were my problem patients and these are the ones that were frustrating me and they were frustrated. And, you know, then it, it evolved to, in my own practice over the last 12 years, evolved to the point where I do this, you know, for every single patient and every patient once a year. When I was focused on just the high risk patients, um, it, I mean, that's a, a, a great thing to do. Obviously, they're the patients that are in most need. But when I branched out and started, you know, introducing the topic to all patients, it gave me the opportunity to have the conversation. This is who we are. This is why we do what we do and talk about, you know, the fact that we want them to be, if, you know, if that's their goal, uh, we can help them become decay-free and, and even if they are healthy, to stay decay-free and identify or help educate them on what risk factors are. If your risk factors should change, um, let us know because that's important. That may impact, um, you know, whether or not you get a cavity in the next six months or the next year. And so instead of just having the high-risk patients be advocates for our practice, um, now everybody has the opportunity to do that. And I catch, I have to tell you, I catch a lot of patients who are in that kind of moderate risk that are, you know, have a high biofilm count, um, you know, a high ATP score, and it gives us the opportunity to have the conversation maybe before they develop the cavities um, or somebody that's zero stomach, you know, to start talking and having those conversations with people even though they aren't um, visibly, you know, breaking down, to have that conversation and share that with them. And again, it, that again, educating the patient or, or spending that time with them gives them the opportunity to go out and become advocates for your practice, uh, ambassadors for your practice as well. Mike, your thoughts? Um, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think uh, when we started incorporating it into um, you know, all of our patients, which we're, we're starting slowly working into doing, um, that we are going to catch a lot of things that we wouldn't normally catch. And we've got a lot of older patients in Florida um, who are on a lot of different medications, who a lot of them have uh, xerostomia, um, recession, so they've got exposed roots, greater increased uh, risk of, of root caries, um, that you know, they may not have any active caries that we're looking at now, and so they're not in our high-risk category of where we're screening them. But I, I think when we start screening them, we're going to start catching a lot more patients that are actually um, in the high-risk area um, based on their ATP scores and their xerostomia and, and things that maybe we need to uh, start addressing or, or catching before they become a problem with those patients. So I, I think the return on all patients is going to be much greater than it is um, what we've seen already, and, and what we've seen already has is, is actually been uh, pretty good. Yeah. Yep. Next all question. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how do you recommend use of screening for high or extreme risk patients if only one screening is covered by insurance per year? What do you do for reassessment? Um, you know, that's another really good question. I, I know that that's one that probably a lot of people you know, struggle with or have questions about. Um, there's a lot of different ways to, to handle that. Uh, one way is if you have um, increased your profi fee enough to cover the cost of the test, um, once a year or twice a year, um, and I'm doing that on all my patients, that covers, you know, I have the, the cost covered to do that on the high-risk patients as frequently as I feel that the patient needs to be tested. Um, and the test is $5 and, what, 90 cents? I mean, we're talking about a patient that may need $30,000 worth of restorative care. Uh, I don't care if, if I get reimbursed for a $5 test. If it helps me and the patient, um, create a clear pathway on toward health and that we both then have the confidence to proceed with a major restorative plan, um, $5 or if I have to do it three or four times and now I've, I'm into it $20, if that patient's spending $30,000, which frequently happens in my practice, um, I, I don't even care. I mean, it's not something I think about. So um, I guess that's how I'd answer that question. I think it's a great question. Um, obviously, I think as we continue to grow down this pathway, the insurance programs need to recognize that 
just as our high-risk periodontal patients need to be seen four times a year, um, and the low-risk patients maybe only need to have their teeth cleaned once a year or once every other year even. The same thing with our high caries risk patients. The people that are high risk, we should be testing and doing these therapies on every three months, and the ones that are low risk, once a year is fine. Um, so um, that's kind of how I'd look at that. Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I would say uh, currently what we're doing in the office is we don't charge for it. We don't charge for um, the caries risk assessment. We don't charge for the uh, scary, uh, the ATP test. Um, we're doing that all as a service for the patient. Um, we are certainly being covered on our cost via uh, the things that we're getting out of it as far as restorative work and, and things like that. But I, I made the uh, decision to not charge, um, and things will probably change in the future. I think when we go to all our patients, we probably will start charging. But I, I wanted to get the program up and running um, with as little impediment as, as possible. So um, that's why we offer it uh, currently as a free of charge. You know, Mike, and you bring up a really good comment there. You know, I, we tend to look at, at, the, at the little things. I mean, hey, we're looking through magnification loops all day long. So we tend to focus on the little things like, well, I'm not being reimbursed for this $5.90 test, or maybe they're using a different test and it's $20. I'm not being reimbursed for that. So I can't afford to do it, so I'm not going to do it. And you look at the reward in terms of the return on that in terms of new patients, from referrals from your own patients, or even the increase in... Uh, large restorative cases on those patients that you get healthy. When you look at that, we spend, what, you know, a, patient, a, a dentist will spend $3,000 on a yellow page ad and hope that one or two patients a month come to their practice uh, on the, from that advertising, or they'll send out direct mailers and spend three or four or $5,000 a month on advertising and hope to get a 2 or 3% uh, you know, return, and now they're given the profi at, at half off or whatever. And, and you know, we'll spend those advertising dollars, we'll throw money at advertising and marketing, and then when it comes to something like this, we go, well, oh, I'm not being reimbursed for it. What do I do? It's $5. You know, it's like, you know what? For the goodwill that that creates in your own practice, it's, it, it, we shouldn't even be thinking about it, right? So anyway, that's a, that's my thought. Um, next question, last question. we got time for one more question, then we should. Uh, yeah, one more question here. Um, Featherstone talks about Carrie's balance protective versus pathologic factors. He further stresses how fluoride helps in remin to a point, but with high bacterial challenge, we need antibacterial agents. What is your opinion on using chlorhexidine or iodine in conjunction with the carry-free products? Wow. Um, that's an interesting question as well. Um, Featherstone, uh, my mentor, uh, obviously <laughs> is... Um, a, a, a renowned expert on the topic, and John and I might differ a little bit on our choice of materials. Um, I used uh, chlorhexidine uh, early on in uh, treatment. I, I then switched to, I didn't find the result from the patients that I was looking for. Um, after about two years, I found it somewhat problematic. I then switched to povidone, povidone iodine, which um, is even more problematic in terms of getting, you know, compliance with the patient, um, and particularly if the patient's a child and you've got issues with uh, iodine allergies, if they're allergic to a shellfish, you know, you've got issues there. So uh, the problem on iodine, I talked about, has, and I taste it, I use it myself. I, I don't use anything on a patient until I use it on me first. And, you know, I could tolerate the problem on iodine, but I have to tell you, that if any, nobody has ever rinsed with that, you should go home and try that because that is an experience in itself. Uh, and that brought me to the sodium hypochlorite. And so in terms of how would I feel about using those carry-free products, I really do believe, I agree with John, uh, remineralization to a point uh, is effective, chloride is effective to a point. Um, but if you've really got a high bacterial load, it's not going to overcome um, a really high bacterial challenge. I mean, you know, you can't overcome that with just fluoride alone. Uh, if that if fluoride by itself worked, we wouldn't even be having this conversation tonight. Um, so I think that we need to look at maybe reducing the, the bacterial load in people's mouths as well. And, and in my mind, uh, certainly the studies that we've done and the clinical experiences I've got, um, the sodium hypochlorite is, is a more effective agent. So uh, John and I have had this conversation on and off for uh, a number of years. And 
hopefully he and I can uh, do, a, do a study and, and do some comparative results here in the near future. Um, that's a great final question. I really appreciate that. I hope I, hope, uh, I answered that adequately. I want to thank everybody tonight for, for tuning in, uh, spending time with Mike and I. Mike, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your experiences. I love, by the way, I love hearing experiences from other dentists that are doing this. Uh, that really is one of the things that um, makes me feel good uh, about you know getting out of bed in the morning and, and spending the time and, and, and doing all of this to help people. So, Mike, I really appreciate that. I, you're gonna. I just want to keep in touch with you and hear about your successes and and your failures as well. But hear about how this impacts your practice over time. Um, that concludes our webinar tonight. Just uh, last thing I'd like to offer is that we've put together at Carry Free. We put together what we call a breakthrough box. Um, and it's really a box that has some samples of materials, uh, the book on balance, a couple copies of that. It has uh, you know simple instructions. So if anybody who hasn't looked at this, hasn't looked at Canberra, uh, wants to try some of the products and get you know just take a uh, a look at it in their practice, please contact us. Contact Carry Free um, either by calling in or on our through our website, and if you will, we'd love to send you a breakthrough box for you to take a look at. So well, we're making that offer available to anybody that's with us tonight. Um, I want to thank you all again, and thank you especially, Mike, and everybody have a great evening, and um, carry on. All right, thank you. We, we appreciate everyone's time. Uh, thank you for participating in this webinar tonight. An email will be sent out tomorrow with a link to the recording for anyone that wants to share this webinar with their staff. Um, and again, please feel free to contact us with any questions. Um, if you'd like to learn more about implementing Canberra into your practice, we do offer complimentary one-on-one -on -one webinars. Um, and we'd happy, be happy to schedule one to fit into your practice's schedule. With that, everyone have a great evening, and thank you. Thank you.